portion of our world so pure lies the largest temperate rainforest in the nation, the Tongass National Forest. Welcome to the special episode of Outdoor Chef Life. We are making a short film of the Tongass National Forest in collaboration with the Sitka Conservation Society. First, I want to thank the sponsors for this video, Yeti and Keen. In this video, we'll be aboard the Equinox with Cameo and Brooks, and we'll be taking a tour of the Tongass National Forest. And we'll be joined by my good friend Dwight, his wife Hazel, and their son Weston. We'll also be taking interviews from the locals and what the Tongass means to them. The Tongass National Forest occupies the majority of southeastern Alaska. It is the most northern temperate rainforest of the world. Seems unlikely to have a rainforest in a place once covered by glaciers this close to the Arctic. But the Tongass thrives with large trees and abundant wildlife. So we have the bigger boat, which is the mothership, and we have this boat as well that we've been tugging behind it. This is the fishing boat. Now we're gonna go to a river and we're gonna try to fish the stream there. We There's probably pink salmon as well as some Dolly Varden. There's a ton of fish jumping right behind us here uh, in this little bay. And uh, this is bear country. There's some bear tracks here. Yes. Look at that, it was walking towards this way. You can see the tracks. Pretty cool. The eagle's carrying something? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Every summer, the different species of salmon here in Alaska take turns to spawn in the rivers. And right now, pink salmon is up to bat. In the net. In the net. Okay. Okay. Move in there. I'm done. Whoa. And if you feel, yeah, go ahead and give it some good tugs. And if you feel something yank on that, give it a nice hard pull back. There you go. Pull. There it is. There it is. There you go. Got him. Weston. Yeah. yeah. If it starts to run, let the line slide through your finger. Okay. There you go. That's it. Now you can let go of the line and just hold on to the reel. But if he's running, let him go. That fish is going downstream, and then when he pulls really hard, you just let go. But, uh, Come here. Yep, there you Come go. here, fish. Let's see if I can make a stab at him. Oh, oh he's yeah, that's running. Good. If, he, if he runs hard, just be ready to let him go. Nice. Got it. Got it. Yeah, you did it. Oh, it's really humpy. Yeah, this. Oh, oh man. It is really humpy. Funny looking fish. <laughs> oh yeah. Hold the net, you can pick them up. That's a humpy. Oh wow, Wes. I did You're it. Bigger than mommy's. Yay! Oh yeah. <laughs> Alright guys, well we caught plenty of pink salmon. Uh, we didn't get any dollies. Uh, Dwight is actually going to print some pinks. Uh, right? Right. So we can watch him do that, but later on, we're, Dwight's going to be printing on a Yeti cooler, and that is going to be super cool. I don't know what we're printing on there yet. We'll see. We're going to go fishing tomorrow, and maybe catch some kings or silvers, or uh, we're going to also drop some shrimp pots. So stay tuned for that. All right, we set some crab pots last oh, night. Oh, it's right here. Oh, shoot. 
<laughs> no, I got it. Weston's gonna be pulling it up. See what we got here. Shit. Oh, not yet. I see yeah, it. You're about going. 24 feet down still. Close. I see it. It's filled. It's filled. <laughs> All right. Ooh, yeah. Maybe one keeper. One keep. This one might be a keeper. This one might be a keeper. Oh, we should probably we can come back. Right? Probably put a little more bait in this pot. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see here. Go ahead, measure. It's it's over big. seven inches. <laughs> over it's seven. Over it's a seven. Keeper. That's a keeper. It's a keeper. All right, throw it back in. Nice. Oh, huh. It's full. Cool. Yeah. pretty good, actually. A couple days good. prior to this, I met up with Leon and Ryan from the Sitka Conservation Society to hear about what their mission is. At the Sitka Conservation Society, our mission is to protect the natural environment of the Tongass National Forest while also supporting the development of environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable communities within Southeast Alaska. In Southeast Alaska, there are 31 communities including 22 federally recognized tribes. The indigenous peoples of Southeast Alaska are the Hlingit, Haida, and Chimshian tribes. They have been stewarding this place since time immemorial, which is over 10,000 years. A keystone kind of species to the ecosystem and communities is salmon. All five species of Pacific salmon return from out in the oceans every fall and they spawn in the thousands of streams across the region. The wildlife, as they're eating salmon, you know, a bear will catch one and drag it up into the forest and what it doesn't eat becomes part of the forest. So it, this, the nutrients of the salmon are supporting the you know, growth of the forest. As our largest national forest, it has a lot of beautiful ancient old growth forests that are very crucial for salmon populations, deer habitat, and a lot of the wild foods that Alaskans and Americans depend upon. The old growth of the Tongass National Forest stores carbon from the atmosphere, and these trees are four to 600 years old, so huge massive trees that are a natural carbon sink. Not only is the Tongass important for the wildlife and all the people that occupy the land, but also important to the rest of the globe as it absorbs the carbon we produce in our daily lives. I didn't really realize how unique of a place this was until I left for college. I would come back here in the summer and really get to experience this place with new eyes and familiarize at the same time and really realize that these things that I have like taken for granted really are pretty unique and special. Back on the equinox, Dwight is creating gyotaku out of the salmon. This is the most important fish to us because our son caught it and he was really excited. It was his first salmon um, on the fly rod. And um, I'm gonna start with this and then we're gonna add um, another one, my wife's hazels fish and then mine the smallest one um, <laughs> kind of like a family portrait for us to remember We also enjoyed our fresh cut Dungeness crabs for dinner.
a little rice bowl with our fresh cut Dungeness crabs, a um, little, what's the seaweed uh, sesame oil one called? Oh, it's Kim Chaban. <laughs> Kim Chaban. <laughs> it's a little side dish that uh, Hazel brought and kimchi scallions and we have also the ikura. Mm. That's a tasty bowl. We spent the rest of the evening watching this coastal brown bear try and catch his dinner. We prepare for a day of salmon fishing in the open ocean. Good morning guys, we are now headed out to the coast. We're gonna try some fishing, probably for some king salmon. We're trying some mooching. I've never caught a king salmon on a mooch, so that would be, that's gonna be a fun experience. Hopefully we get on a good school, and maybe we'll catch some halibut, rockfish, wing cod as well, if uh, for bonus, if we're lucky. You ready? Bring the luck. Pretty much all the way to the bottom, okay. which is about 180 feet, but you may go out more than that. Okay. And, you know, just work yeah. it right back up. So right now we're mooching, dropping all the way to the bottom. It's about 180 feet. We'll bring it back up a little, drop it back down, bring it back up, drop it back down, and it's spinning. Okay, it's the Sean. This is a good one. We're looking for salmon. It's a ling cod. It's a ling. What's a keeper size? Oh no, it's a little short. Yeah, I think he is gonna be long. He's like 28, 29, maybe. Hey, Dwight's got a silver. Nice. Good job. Yeah, first salmon. I didn't see what happened with the net over there, did they? Oh, oh, I got one. Ooh, nice. Ooh, that that's, followed it up. That's some good this is a salmon for sure, right? He's running so. Ooh, oh, nice that looks like a king. Maybe. I think it's a silver. But no, yeah. You know. Maybe. Yeah, the first hit. Whoa! Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. Whoa. Nice. On the mooch. That was sick. On the way up. Oh, oh my god. Ooh, he's just not done. Not done yet. Sheesh. Sheesh. I was just reeling it up fast. And he hit that thing hard. And we have one fish on the line. That's the best time to possibly be fishing. That's when there's maybe a school around. Drop it back, jump it back. The fish is moving and, and sort of move around the fish. There we go. Oh, there's a fish right, right there. Falling right out. Yeah. Go ahead. There's yeah. a whole school of them up near the surface right now. It is a little king. Oh, is it? It is, yeah. Uh, we're going to have to let him go. He's like, he was fighting like a silver. So sure. Sometimes that was in the a water, king. Yeah. Yeah, that's maybe 26, huh? Oh, first king salmon, but that's a little undersized. Keeper size is 28 inches. That one's probably close to 26, something like that. That was sweet. When he first, cool. when he first hit that sort of like slower, heavier shake. Yeah. The silvers are. 
it, it's hard to explain, but when you get that kind of just, there's a fish down there right now at about 60. Nice. Um, it's, it's just a different shake and the uh -huh. flash back and forth, uh -huh. that's very characteristic of the Kings. But then oh, when yeah. he started jumping and the size, I was like, ah, it's definitely a silver. Yeah. But no, you were right, right off the bat. That was... Nice. Nice. <laughs> Dwight got a link. I just got hit. I just got hit. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is a good one. Pretty good. Pretty good fish. Oh. Oh, here we go. This my this I think this is a ling cod too. Yep. Oh halibut. Yep. Yeah. Halibut. Oh, all kinds of fish coming yeah, up. We got a good variety. <laughs> The other thing that yeah. happens is you'll be halibut fishing. Yeah. Salmon. Yeah, that's good. Uh, dude, I'm going to be a salmon. Oi. There you go. He has woken up. There you go. Get out and down as much as you can. Around me. Ooh, I think I just had a hit too. If you see oh, yep. Drop it right back down. Oh, yep. There it is. Oh, no. Oh. That, that was a nicer one. Yeah. That hit the first time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good fight. Good fight. Oh yeah, that sucks. Like it's a chum. Yeah, it's fine. Well, it doesn't matter. You can still eat them too. Taco, my first king. Nice. It's a keeper too. It actually looks like a king. Looks like a keeper. Oh, yeah, that's a fatty. That's a good one. Nice. Oh, <laughs> two for two. Pounds. First silver, first king. Yes. Yeah. Nice. My first king salmon. Nice. That's a pretty fish, isn't it? That's a good fish. Up. Oh God! Awesome on. I'm assuming you guys are keeping all these guys that we get. Yes, please. Yeah. Awesome on. How deep was it? Nice. That's a good one. Here. Awesome on. Ooh. Long silver. Yeah, but bullet. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a go. <laughs> they do it wrong. Crazy. Psycho. Yeah, as I got 150. Good size chum. So far, we've caught lingcod, halibut, silver salmon, chum salmon, and king salmon. These productive fishing grounds have been supporting small communities across southeast Alaska for many decades. We met up with a longtime salmon trawler, as well as a fish processor, to get a little more insight. Hi, my name is Joe Emerson. I'm a commercial salmon fisherman in southeastern Alaska. Right now, I'm here in Pelican, Alaska, and I'm a, a salmon trawler, a hook and line fisherman. I've been fishing for 47 years in southeastern Alaska. My home is Juneau. My name's Seth Stewart. I was born and raised in Pelican. I had a bunch of friends that would come over to eat and be like, I don't really like eating salmon, it's too fishy. And so that's how this whole thing got started was I just gave them my fish and they're like, oh, this is the best stuff we've ever had. And it was just stuff that we'd caught or, you know, just like, a fresh catch. just a fresh catch. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. fresh packed, you know, and whatever taken care of. Yeah. And they're like, I don't really like salmon, but this is the best stuff I've ever had. Yeah. Like, well, that's because you've never really had anybody that takes care of it. How do you know if there's a fish on there? Uh, because since the line is suspended by the, uh, this, what they call a tag line, which goes to the end of the pole, mm -hmm. there's bells up there. Oh. 
This is what the leader looks like. Yeah. This is a flasher. It goes round and round and kind of gives the the this little hoochie, what they call a hoochie, mm -hmm. the action. And uh, uh, when it when it comes up, uh, it's unsnapped off the line, snapped back on here. And at this point, you're kind of playing the fish. It's of course trying to get off. Yeah. And it's like sport fishing without a pole. You just have a pair of gloves. Then when the fish gets closer, you uh, basically hit it on the head and knock it unconscious. Mm -hmm. And then you turn the gaff hook over and it's stuck in the fish's gills or head. And then it's pulled aboard. And it, we bring the fish right over here and we have our fish cleaning knives and we clean the fish right here. Mm. Yeah. And we have this, these right little... Right away, right out of the right water. Right away. We stick this little um, needle, you might call it, mm -hmm. and it's got water flowing through oh, it. Oh, yeah. And that goes right in, after we remove the gills, we stick this in the main artery of the fish, and um, this water flowing through here enters into the circulatory system of the fish and flushes out mm -hmm. all of the blood. We put a little pipette in there that's mm -hmm. seawater, and it pumps, the heart will pump the blood out. And so then it replaces all the blood in the system with seawater, mm -hmm. you know, salt water, which kind of preserves them. And then you get them right onto ice immediately. Yeah. And so it kind of preserves them like that. And they last, yeah. I mean, the shelf life on them is so much longer. This fishery isn't a volume fishery. It's, it's all about quality rather than volume. Oh, yeah. And uh, that, that's kind of what, you know, is the sustainable aspect of it in that we're not trying to catch massive numbers. Yeah. We're just trying to catch fewer numbers and make sure that it's total quality. I love that. And yeah. taking really good care of. Yeah. It's just not the way the current industry is set up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's about, you know, you get paid by the pound, so it's volume. Um, and then really trying to switch the whole idea from volume to quality and trying to get, you know, spend yeah. a little more time on it and then convince the consumer that because you can walk in a store and buy something that's a lot cheaper. Um, that doesn't have 100% traceable and isn't the best quality you can get. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've really tried. You know, it's a, it's a customer education thing. Yeah. As time has gone on, yeah. people have learned more about taking care of fish and quality has been emphasized more and more over the years, uh, in part because of the competition from farm salmon. These fish that I catch, mm -hmm. we process, well, we, we clean them and clean them ice them and then we deliver them right over there. Oh, uh, yeah. And the fish are uh, filleted and vacuum packed mm -hmm. or they're made into portions and we sell the fish online on our website. And over there is Jacoby Fishery back with Seth. Kind of the other idea of this you know the original business model which we still do a lot of was um, like co-packing for other fishermen that wanted to do the same thing I originally started out doing. Yep. Take their own catch process it, have somebody process it, take it down south and sell it in farmers markets and whatever. Yeah. And so we do a, a, a large majority of the volume that we do is co-pack stuff for other people. Oh. Um, so it's their fish, they come and deliver it to us and we cut it up and put their label on it and mm. sell it, um, which is a big part of what we're doing. So we're supporting local fishermen buying from them, mm -hmm. but then also we're supporting all of these smaller fishermen that want to go to direct market their own yeah. you know, brands. One of the big things that we do too is each package that we pack process has a boat name on it so every boat it's 100 percent traceable so we unload it we put a boat name on the totes we label how many fish are from each person mm -hmm. and then when we run it through the line each bag's got a name on it yeah so this is the one of our copac labels okay. hook and line so this guy he's got his own boat that he catches his own fish and then we copac for him so then it's all the the flash frozen idea oh yeah Ooh, it's cold here so here's a, in the winter. this is our gillnet brand. Okay. So this fish all came from the Taku River. Taku River. <laughs> Very I, know, I know, it's got my name on <laughs> This is actually yours. Uh, yeah, it's got, this is all mine right here. This it's whole rack, all of these racks, they're all yours. <laughs> yeah. It's got your name on it. There's our label. Yeah, the moisture, yeah, oh man, it's. Hook and line, caught wild in Alaska. <laughs> This freezer freezes to like negative 25, but it'll get to like negative 35, so. Wow, yeah. Uh, I mean, it really only takes, for this kind of stuff, it'll be, oh no, I gotta make sure I put this back on the, get in trouble by the packing crew if I don't <laughs> put it in the right spot. Oh uh, yeah. 
It takes less than three hours to freeze those in there. Wow. They, they see the name on the boat and they're like, can I get some of that fish from this boat? And you're like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, even though they, that's sort just Sort of builds a relationship with uh, the consumer and, and the, the fishermen. boat, even the fishermen. Right, that's yeah. the whole small boat idea, right? Yeah. And so that they, and it's pride for them that the fishermen, which is where a lot of guys sell the was, yeah. is because they want their stuff taken care of. They take care of it. They want it to be appreciated yeah. with money, but they also want it to be appreciated by the end consumer. Yeah. If it just goes in one pile, nobody knows the difference. Because the more we can explain to people what we do, the more they're interested in buying the product. People so, want to know where the fish comes from and yeah. how it's taken care of. And, that, yeah. and so we have found that the more face-to-face -face contact we can have with the store owners and the customers, uh, the more business we you know, do. Yeah, and now more than ever, it feels like it's really important to know where yeah. the fish comes from. Yeah. In this day and age, traceability is key for sustainability. Fish processors like Yokobi Fisheries have made it possible for consumers to know exactly where your fish comes from, to build a relationship between you and commercial fishermen like Joe. You always have to be kind of making sure that the uh, habitat for salmon spawning is protected. Yeah. And uh, well, once you lose that, you lose the fish, and there's so many other species in the Tongass that are dependent on these salmon, eagles, bears, you name it, you know, uh, that it's critical that these fish be maintained. I can't even imagine what the ecosystem would be like if all of a sudden the salmon were extinguished. Uh, it'd be dozens of other species that would go the same route almost immediately. Yeah. I mean, I'd probably say half of the community members are tied to the commercial fishing fleet, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in some way or another. Yeah. Um, and it was built, I mean, that's what this community was built for, was commercial fish posh this. I mean, so um, it's very important to small communities in Alaska. So the more that we can do to take care of that stuff, the longer it's going to last. The livelihood of these small Alaskan towns depend heavily on the salmon's well-being. And Sitka Conservation Society works to protect salmon habitat so future generations of Southeast Alaskans can continue the ways of life sustained by salmon. Back on our fishing boat, Jocelyn is about to take over. Be ready, I might let go. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Jocelyn's on a nice king salmon right now. <laughs> oh no no no! Oh no! Oh man! Oh. oh no! That was literally right after we asked the ocean to give us a king. Yeah, I know. So we're going another fish. Nice silver salmon, probably. Whoa! Oh, Dwight's on over there too. Dwight's on. He doubled up. Nobody <laughs> Broke you off? Yeah. Whoa. You. Jocelyn is on fire right now. She keeps asking the ocean gods for her fish. And it keeps happening. Boom, boom, boom. The ocean provides, <laughs> baby. <laughs> See what I'm saying? On fire. It's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. She's in, she's out of control right now. that, we head back to the mothership. Okay. Okay. Now we're back on the mothership. Oh, what a day of fishing. That was awesome. Good job. She said she got carpal tunnel because her <laughs> wrist hurt. There's too many fish. <laughs> that was some good fishing. That was some good fishing, that's for sure. 
All right, we're off to our anchor point for tonight. I think we're also gonna drop some uh, shrimp pots tonight. We gotta do that ASAP so we can get some prawns, some, some spot prawn, and hopefully we'll have some tomorrow, That's by so tomorrow. Fun. Yeah, we're about to go drop some shrimp pots so we can get some spot prawn. Um, but check these out. Everybody's got the the keen slippers on. Oh, I got my keen slippers on too. Ooh, thank you, Keen, for setting this up. Ooh, and Camille's got hers too. And these ones are actually special artist design, and um, one percent of the proceeds donated to the Tongas, which is where we're at right now. Perfect. So thank you, Keen. Yeah. And we went to drop a couple shrimp pots and called it a night. So we ended up setting some traps last night. Now we're pulling him up, and we'll find out what's in him. <laughs> I see it. Oh yeah, I see it. I see it, it's oh, coming up. Come on, shrimp, come on. Uh, I don't know. Got some spot prawn. With that, we head back to the Equinox and we get on some kayaks to shoot b-roll of salmon swimming upstream. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna do a special print on this Yeti cooler right here. Dwight and I thought it would be a great idea if he did a print and we auctioned it off and then donated 100% of the proceeds to the Sick Conservation Society. And when we found out that Yeti uh, wanted to sponsor the video, Dwight thought it, was, it would be a good idea to print on an actual Yeti cooler. And Yeti thought that was a great idea as well. So that's what we're doing. Dwight is working on the print right now he's gonna get it right on that cooler we're gonna be using my instagram and we're gonna auction off the cooler and we'll be donating 100 percent of the proceeds to the sika conservation society so if you win this cooler you'll be supporting their great work in protecting salmon habitat across the tongas national forest now let's watch dwight do his thing
Sick. Taku's going to be biggest bidder on his own Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Dwight finished off the print by signing it and spraying multiple coats of protective sealant. And the final product is a masterpiece. That is 100% one of the most unique Yeti coolers ever. Whew. Great job, Dwight. Amazing, amazing. If you guys haven't, uh, if you guys don't know about him, fishing for Gyotaku on Instagram website. He does amazing work like this. Check him out. Whew. But whoever gets that is going to be one lucky person. And we'll be auctioning this off on the same week as the release of this video. So go to my Instagram, Outdoor Chef Life, for more information. And right now we're going to go over to uh, the beach and we'll do some cooking. We'll go cook our our food, our our seafood that we've been gathering. We've got crab, we got salmon, uh, we got uh, the spot prawn as well. And yeah, uh, we'll go have a little fire and say goodnight. Time to fill up our Yeti roadie with beer and ingredients to make our meal and head over to the beach. Feeling grateful for our harvest and thankful to the ones that stewarded this place since time immemorial. The native Klinkit, Haida, and Shimshian peoples have taken well care of the Tongass as it is their home. Their cultures are intertwined with the resources of the land and sea. During our time in Southeast Alaska, I had the pleasure of meeting with my friend Ricky and his father, who are native Klinkit. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gush uh, Dehin. I am Klinkit of the Eagle Wolf Clan, um, and I'm from Huna, Alaska. And I am a grad student at UAS, um, fo focusing on uh, teaching the Klinkit language. And when I'm not studying, I do um, subsistence hunting and fishing here in the Tongass. <laughs> Um, my name is Gachkwena. I'm a member of the Shungukedi or Thunderbird clan. I'm a child of the Sakai clan. Um, I'm Clinkit and Filipino and have uh, you know lived here and grown up here and in Juneau and in this area. Um, home of my ancestors who have occupied uh, the Tongass for more than 10,000 years, and um, um, I don't see myself going <laughs> anywhere else. Subsistence fishing is uh, any sort of like gather hunting, gathering, or fishing we do primarily to feed ourselves and our community. It's a lot more like it's a lot more culture-based how we used to do it. So the food, like the fish we catch, isn't just for us. It's for um, our community, our clan. Um, even though we can't do it in the same ways we used to be able to. So we still have to work through fish and game and go use their regulations. Um, but I fish a proxy for myself, so I am allowed 25 sockeye. And then I fish a proxy for my grandma because she can't go out and fish for herself, so she'll get 25. But of those 50 that we get, uh, we distribute that through a lot more people. We be respectful for the land, ha'ani, that's a clinket word for our land, and it, and it doesn't mean a possession, it's, a, it's a, a spiritual, cultural relationship that we have um, with the land. Our identity is where we connect with um, our spirituality, our ancestors, those that came before us, because they walked these lands just as we did, and fished and hunted just like we did. So for me, it's subsistence fishing is, yes, primarily about putting food on the table, 
um, but also about connecting with our community, practicing our cultural values, and um, um, growing into my identity as a Tlingit person. You know, in our family, and I know a lot of other cultures, um, you know, men are the cooks, and, and you know, my grandfather, my dad, all of my uncles, um, relatives, um, you know, all the men, you know, cook. And, uh, you know, I grew up, and so my recipes are, are a combination of, of, you know, my dad's and my uncle's uh, mongo beans or adobo, um, even the way I cook salmon and how we season it. Uh, you cook yourself? Yes, I love cooking. Um, yeah. Cooking is um, definitely something that was also communal growing up. Uh, yeah. We were lucky enough that we, that my family is uh, mixed, so we're half, half Klinkit, half Filipino. So we get the best of both worlds. We get the best ingredients from the Klinkit side and then uh, Filipino recipes. So adobo, sinigang, kare kare, lumpia, fried rice. Yeah. Um, that's that Klinkit Filipino fusion is definitely an up and coming, or it well it has been here, but it's yeah. definitely now starting to come into the spotlight here in Southeast. I enjoy cooking and it's been really great uh, cooking with my son mm -hmm. uh, because he uh, you know, has a lot more courage uh, in trying different things. I guess as we're talking about the Tongass and uh, as a future educator myself, a big battle we're working on now is imagine everyone else that does seafood is talking about is the sustainability aspect. I'm lucky enough that my grandparents and the generations that came before me since the last 17,000 years managed these fisheries and um, other resources we have with us so well that they lived in abundance, but they also made sure that they passed these down to us. You know, what? the way our ancestors, you know, made it work is that um, all of our decision making and our values were based on um, the survivability for our grandchildren. You know, when you think about future um, generations and that's going to be the basis of your decision making, is this good for, you know, my grandkids and for their future? But as you know, we're facing climate change and the world's evolving. We're running into issues of scarcity with these things that we never had scarcity of before. So we're really concerned of like, okay, how can we preserve this in a way that we can keep letting future generations do this and I can teach them how to hunt and fish. But like I said, it's also a cultural thing. I'm worried that if the fish go, so does every aspect of our culture. The Tongass and, and this land here in Southeast uh, um, is a treasure uh, for the earth. A treasure that many people and organizations like Sitka Conservation Society are fighting to protect. In order to save the salmon, we need to preserve the forest. The old growth trees regulate carbon in our atmosphere, which can help regulate ocean temperatures and acidification leading to a healthy ecosystem for the salmon to thrive. I read a quote on a website completely separate from the Tongass, but fits in perfectly. Life on land and life in the ocean are bonded in unexpectedly powerful ways. While they may seem like separate realms, the well-being of one depends on the other. All this talk about food is getting me hungry. Let's get on the beach and cook a delicious meal. Got the prawns in here, and uh, Dwight's wife Hazel brought some Korean ingredients. This is gochujang and gochugaru, and uh, some other stuff. I got my kelp chili crisp, of course. We got a fresh caught spot prawn. She also brought this stuff. This is to like, it's like a kimchi. Um, it's to make kimchi basically, but it's a powder form, so you just add water. We got some sesame oil, of course. So. Let's start with the beer. So since Hazel brought some delicious uh, green ingredients, we're gonna make some kimchi soup with the salmon, crab, and shrimp. That'll be tasty. Uh, we'll also just uh, do some raw preparations of the spot prawn too because we need we need it. We need to do that.
because it's so so good raw. We got a chum salmon, we got a coho, and we also have some king salmon as well. But these two we're gonna grill on the fire. Just gonna do a little seasoning. This is a reason why. Kind of a small one. Like, what's the speeding up? <laughs> <laughs> it's like watching turtles race. <laughs> this is a contest. They're rolling rocks <laughs> for seats. Bio first. <laughs> oh, good to see that. <laughs> <Pulls> through. <laughs> Oh no, Camille's coming in at the end! Oh no, I think Yes! Much <laughs> closer! Win! <laughs> I'm back too close now. <laughs> too close, too yeah, close. Too close. <laughs> That's Justin. why I chose a rock I can pick up. I need a beer now. Come on. Come on. Throw some leaks in here. Oh, good. Put down. This is legit. Got a little bit of soy sauce. I forgot what Hazel said this was. She's over there fishing. Let's see, I think it's like miso or something. It's like miso, huh? We'll add, it. And we'll add this stuff in that she brought. It has all kinds of ingredients in there. Got some fresh crab. Let's get this salmon on too. Let's get some napa cabbage in the soup. I'm just gonna throw, put this whole piece of salmon in there. <laughs> it'll, it'll just break break apart once it as it cooks. Just cover that up. Hazel made this uh, green onion kimchi, and we we'll put that in there too. Yeah, I'll just gonna toss it in. And crab's probably almost done. We have it all done. Check it out. Ooh. Yeah, that looks awesome. <laughs> so we got some seafood kimchi soup. We got just fresh spot prawn. No need much for that. Just a little lime juice, sea salt. We have the grilled coho and grilled uh, chum. And we also have some salt water boiled Dungeness crabs. Do a little Alaskan feast right here. Cheers, guys. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Thank you for yeah. taking us on an awesome adventure. Thanks for coming. Yes. Great. Mm -hmm.
we're doing. Yeah, baby. As always. Amazing job. Oh, dude. Yay. Amazing. My pleasure. It's so much fun. Yeah. Thank you so for the meal. Fun. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you can make it. Nice and spicy. Mm -hmm. Go in on the prawn. Yeah, I'm trying to decide how to. That one went to attack that. Mm. Ooh, sweet in there. Sweet in there. It's really good with that. Prawn head's really good with that sauce. Oh, Does it add a little spice to oh. that? Mm. Oh my God. That's good. Did you? That's good. Mmm. 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 It'll help, but. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Mm. That's good. Yeah. That's delicious. Mmm. Man, raw is definitely the way to go. Mmm. Mmm. -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these are better though for freezing. Yeah. The head, this is really good for the heads though, I think, because I like the sauce with them. Yeah, because you can get a couple, you can like re dip mm -hmm. and then get more of the stuff out. Yeah. While you're nice and uh, comfortable feasting over here uh -huh. on this food, what do you think about the area? About, about the Tongass, Southeast uh, Alaska? And it's paradise. It's absolutely paradise. I can't wait to come back. If I die, I hope it looks like this. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> what do you think of it, Wes? I love it. You love it? You love it. Want to come back? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you would like to get involved or donate directly to the Sitka Conservation Society, you can do so with the link below. And you should also be able to donate uh, directly from this YouTube video as well, just on the side. So thank you all for so much for watching and thank you for supporting the channel as well as the Conservation Society. All appreciate it. See you on the next one.